This is the motto of the show, Hour of the Truth. Rome never changes. They used to call us heretics and sent the Inquisition to kill us. Today they call us terrorists and send on their crusades. Times and methods may have changed, the goal still stays the same. Extirpate the remnant of the true word of God, Bible believing people who will hold the truth in Jesus Christ's name. Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by His death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints that history cannot erase with iron heel and iron hand the Roman popes rule the land those ignorant of history may be swept into apostasy we won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today they offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Hello and welcome to a new video from Joggler 66 Hour of the Truth. This is already reading 24, if I'm not mistaken, of the wonderful book, The History of the Inquisition. And we are getting really into the things that come become very interesting, even though the thing we will start with is a little bit of a flashback uh, until the four the first four ecumenical councils that were held within the Roman Catholic Church. That is the time when the apostasy came into the church, the time that Paul warned of in Second Thessalonians when he said, um, I, I, "Was it Second Thessalonians? I don't know anymore." But, but, but when he said that uh, uh, there will come a great apostasy, yes, to first must uh, the falling away come, and then the man of sin will be revealed. And uh, at the time when the pagan Roman Empire clothed itself with uh, the name of Christianity by making Christianity the state religion of the pagan Roman Empire. That is the time when the big falling away came. I mean, uh, Constantine III in 321 and 325, we have the Council of Nicaea, which is the first Catholic council. A council that has nothing to do anymore with the dogma of the Bible, but with all with the dogma of the Church and putting the Church and tradition above the Word of God. The same world we live in today. Anyway, I don't want to make it too big of an introduction here. We have enough to read and uh, I hope that my eyes will uh, uh, hold through and my voice will hold through that you can uh, follow my reading of History of the Inquisition from Philip van Limborch. Uh, we are going to start there where we took off last time and that is on page 7 of volume 2, The History of the Inquisition, chapter 3, which is called The Laws of the Emperors after the Nicene Council against the Arians and other heretics. Yeah? So, <clears throat> that we understand this well, the word heretics here is used in the sense of what the Roman Catholic Church uh, defines as heretics. And we will come to that uh, during the reading. It's a very important point. I think it's on the next page, 
because I written I think two two and a half pages or so in advance, not too much. But there we will understand what a heretic actually is, and this explanation of a heretic that I will give you then. Uh, if, if you can't keep it in your mind, then write it down. Uh, that is really something very important to keep. But okay, let's see where the author starts here. After the conversion of Constantine, which I just mentioned, to the Christian religion, which is of course not true because Constantine never converted to biblical Christianity. Never. The civil power became vested in the hands of Christians. And uh, if you want to read a little bit about that, then uh, you can f look up my playlist, uh, Babylon Mystery Religion. There you can also see something of that history. This change in their circumstances produced as, uh, as great a chance, produced as great a, chan a change, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I butchered this one already, I'm sorry. This change in their circumstances produced as great a change in their doctrine and manners, and the degenerate posterity devi uh, deviating from the example of their ancestors introduced into the church methods of cruelty not only equal to those of the heathen, but even greater than were ever practiced by them. This already is the very first proof that we are dealing with the Antichrist here. Because the first Christians even prayed for the emperors of Rome to stay in power because they knew that whatever power would come, af would come after them would be so much worse than the emperors themselves. We read this here now and this is just the time after Constantine uh, baptized the pagan Roman Empire with Christianity and this is about the time the Christians started to pray for that because they knew that the time had come when the Antichrist will be revealed. The little horn is now really growing and they knew that in that time. And if you don't believe me then turn to Romanism and the Reformation page 195 and read the prayer the early Christians prayed for the continuance of the pagan Roman Empire because they knew that what comes after that will be the Antichrist of the Bible. Now, what gave the first rise to it was the dispute between uh, the dispute, sorry, the dispute between Alexander, Bishop of Alexandria, and Arius, a presbyter of the same church. When the news of this was brought to Constantine, he first, by letters, sharply reproved them both. And you remember that we spoke about that already in the first volume. But here's a little recapitulation of that. Alexander for being needed, needlessly inquisitive, and Arius for his imprudent answers about an unnecessary question, which arose from their want of being better employed and a contentious and factious spirit, and seriously exhorts them to mutual peace in these words, amongst others. This is these are the words of the Emperor, Constantine, quote, Since therefore the one hath been neatly inquisitive, and the other as imprudent in his answers, you ought mutually to pardon each other. And as you do not differ about any of the principal requirements of the Christian law, nor pretend to introduce any new opinion into the worship of God, but are in these things of one and the same mind, you ought to maintain communion with one, other, with one another." Unquote. But afterwards, with the persuasion of the bishops, or out of, this, uh, out of some political view, he, Constantine, called the Nicene Council, that by their authority the opinion of Arius might be condemned. Eusebius, who was present at that council, was able to give the best account of it. But he chose rather that their actions should be ever forgotten, and contended himself in a very, in very, in a very few words to declare the issue of it. And if we add to the account given by him, the somewhat larger one given by Socrates, it appears plain that all who would not subscribe to their decrees were condemned to banishment, and there is no room to doubt. Such are the frailties of human nature. 
but that many through fear were compelled to subscribe. Some few indeed there were who not at all terrif uh, some few indeed there were who not at all terrified with the fear of banishment went into exile with Arius, whom the synod had condemned because they would not consent to his condemnation. The emperor himself put forth an edict by which he ordained that all the books written by Arius should be burned, condemning to death every one that should conceal any of Arius' books and not commit them to the flames. He afterwards put forth a fresh law against the recusants, by which he took from their places of worship and prohibited their meeting not only in public, but even in private houses whatsoever. The same about this law, in, um, if you remember that, I hope. Um, I think it was made law last year in Russia, where it is forbidden to proselyte outside of the church. And that is the first step of this religious persecution. And that's in Russia, and other countries will probably follow. As we can hear, it's nothing new under the sun. Yeah? prohibited their meeting not only in public, but even in any private houses whatsoever. So, gathering of God-fearing people is forbidden not only in public, but even in any private house whatsoever. Okay. After they had thus proceeded to methods of severity and civil punishments were decreed against those whose opinions on the council were pleased to condemn whom they exposed under the infamous name of heretic, and rendered odious to the people their cruelty was not satisfied with one degree of punishment only. They went from one to another, that so the doctrine condemned by the council might, fi might find none that should dare to defend it, and so might at last be totally extirpated. From pecuniary uh, mulcts, which is a fine or a compulsory payment. I had to look that word up, because so I'm going to tell you because I didn't know this word. So from pe pecuniary mulcts, they proceeded to the forfeiture of goods, banishments, and at length to slaughter and blood. For such is the nature of cruelty, that it seldom confines itself to the first beginnings, but when it is let loose like an imp impetuous torrent, it spreads itself everywhere, and from every occasion grows, out, grows more outrageous and furious. Like a tsunami. Eh? This will appear most plainly in the account I am now giving of the methods for the restraining and punishment of heretics. For in the first place, laws were made against heretics, whereby they were prohibited from having churches, prohibited from holding assemblies, the enjoying and any ecclesiastical preferments, the con uh, consecration of bishops, the ordinations of priests, the making of wills, the succeeding to inheritances, the sharing in any charities, the advancement to public offices, and ordaining severe punishments against those who did not observe these prescriptions. Now, at first, and first now the author says, and first it was determined who should be accounted heretics. Now comes the explanation that I'm going to read to you. Listen very closely. They are comprehended under the name of heretics and are adjudged to the punishments pronounced against such who shall be discovered to differ even in the least point from the judgment and practice of the Catholic religion. By the same law, it is ordained that no one should dare either to teach or learn those things that shall have been decreed to be profane. I hope you understood that well. The definition of a heretic. I'm going to read it to you once again. And first, it was determined who would be accounted heretics. 
They are comprehended under the name of heretics and are judged to the punishments pronounced against such who shall be discovered to differ, even at in the least point, from the judgment and practice of the Catholic religion. By the same law it is ordained that no one should dare either to teach or learn those things that shall have been decreed to be profane. That is the definition the Roman Catholic Church gave here in the beginning about who is a heretic. And I have to fix this here. Okay. And this definition is still going on today. It's still the same. So it is the Roman Catholic Church that invented that term heretic. It is the Roman Catholic Church that defined what a heretic is was in that time and is still today and we bible believing christians are not speaking about heretics we're speaking about pagans because there are only people who adhere to the god the creator god of the universe or people who adhere to other gods and those are pagan gods heathen gods we don't speak about heretics we don't speak about committing heresy we speak about being pagan and heathen for them the unbelievers. But unbelievers is also a word that they use, or infidels. And I try to use other terms to make a distinguishing between um, Bible-believing Christians and yeah, the rest of the population, let's say it like that. So, with this explanation of who a heretic is, you have to understand the whole rest of the reading of the book. I mean, you also have to understand the whole reading of the book that was done so far, but here you can hear it from the horse's mouth itself. It was determined who should be accounted heretics. Everyone who does even uh, who does not uh, or who who uh, goes away from the judgment and practice of the Catholic religion. That's it. You do not agree with the judgment and the, and the practice and the policy of the Catholic religion, the universal religion, because that's what Catholic means. You are a heretic. And now the other thing that you maybe saw here in this little text that I just put up, because I looked that up then, um, when we go to uh, Pope Gregory VII, who lived in the 11th century, who was also called Hildebrand and was also known from the pilgrimage or penance to Canossa from the German king Henry the uh, Henry the Fourth. According to Decreti Pars II Causa 23, Quest 5, in Canon 47, he said the following: Those are not to be accounted homicides who, fired with zeal for the Mother Church may have killed excommunicated persons. Who is an excommunicated person? Well, <laughs> everyone who is not a Catholic, everyone who is called a heretic, is excommunicated. So, when you put these things together, you have the building of the uh, rightful, they say at least, lawful, let, let's call it lawful, their lawful grounds on building the Inquisition. First, they determine who they are going to persecute, namely everyone who does not adhere to the dogmas and the politics of the Roman Catholic Church. And then they say, that everybody who does not adhere to the Roman Catholic Church is anathema. We will come to that later. You will see that. Uh, who is He is cursed. And like King Henry IV and others, is excommunicated. And in the moment these people are excommunicated, they are free to kill. So, Those are not to be accounted homicides. So, kills who are not accounted to be homicides, who, fired with zeal for Mother Church, may have killed excommunicated persons. That means everyone 
from the Roman Catholic cult, because it's nothing else than a cult, everyone from the Roman Catholic cult who kills with the zeal for the mother church, the end justifies the means, an excommunicated person, that killing, that murder, is not accounted as homicide, means it is no sin to kill a heretic. That's what it comes down to. And what did Jesus tell us in the Bible? He said they will throw you out of the synagogues, they will persecute you, they will kill you, and they think they do God's work. Does that now make sense when you read it in this context? And you've just read it from the book, The History of the Inquisition. Go and do your own research if you don't believe me. But this is what Catholics are really all about. And I don't speak of the Catholic lay people. Okay? I don't speak of the poor betrayed souls like quote unquote you and me. I speak of the hierarchy of the Roman Catholic Church. And they incite these lay people through their indoctrinated false belief to persecute God's believing people like you and me. Okay? Now back to the book. By the law following, their churches are taken from them, and they are prohibited to perform holy offices, either in private houses or churches, under the forfeiture of 100 pounds of gold upon all contra uh, contraveners. The following law is yet more severe, which takes from them the power of giving, buying, selling, making contracts or wills, or inheriting their parents' estates, unless they renounce their heretical practice, uh, uh, brevity. There are many laws extend concerning the banishments of heretics. Theodosius II and Valentian III, counting, counting up 32 sects, and their followers decree, quote, let not these and the mannequins who are arisen to the height of impiety, have the liberty of dwelling and anywhere within the dominions of the Roman Empire. Let the Manichaeans be expelled from every city and punished with death, for they are not to be suffered to have any dwelling on the earth, lest they should infect the very elements themselves. Unquote. See also N. Qui Kanki, it's a strange name, Quikanki, that's I think uh, a French name. See also El Quikanki, so his writings, where the forementioned penalties are not only repeated, but other kinds of punishments ordained against them, which are all extant in the law of the Emperor Martian, who renews the punishments ordained by the preceding emperors against the Eutychians and which is recorded at the end of the Council of Chalcedon. Look that up. The Council of Chalcedon was the fourth ecumenical council, and which will, suffice, uh, which, uh, which will, suff suff and which will suffice instead of all other instances. By this law, the emperor, Constantine in this, in this case, by this law the emperor ordained, quote, that they should not have the power of disposing their estates and making a will, nor of inheriting what others should leave them by will. Neither let them receive advantage by any deed of gift, but let whatsoever is given them, either, be the, uh, either by the bounty of the living or by the will of the dead, be immediately forfeited to our treasury nor let them have the power by any title or deed of gift to transfer any part of their own estates to others. Neither shall it be lawful for them to have or ordain bishops or presbyters or any other of the clergy whatsoever, as knowing that the Eutychians and Apollinarists, who shall presume to, cons uh, to confer the names of bishop or presbyter, or any other sacred office upon anyone, as well as those who shall dare to retain them, 
shall be condemned to banishment and the forfeiture of their goods. And as to those who have been formerly ministers in the Catholic Church or monks of the Orthodox faith, and forsaking the true and Orthodox worship of the Almighty God, have or shall embrace the heretics and abominable opinions of Apollinarius or Eutychius, let them be subject to all the penalties ordained by this, or any foregoing laws whatsoever against heretics and banished from the Roman dominions, according as former laws have decreed against Manichaeans. Farther, he continues, Farther, let not any of the Apollinarists or Eutychians build churches or monasteries or have assemblies or conventicles either by day or night. Nor let the followers of this accursed sect meet in any one's house or tenement, or in a monastery, or in any other place whatsoever. But if they do, and it shall appear to be with the consent of the owners of such places, after a due examination, let such place or tenement in which they meet be immediately forfeited to us, or if it be a monastery, let it be given to the Orthodox Church of that city in whose territory it is. But if so be they hold these unlawful assemblies and conventicles without the knowledge of the owner, but with the privity of him who receives the rents of it, the tenant, agent or steward of the estate, let such tenant, agent or steward or, whoso, uh, or whoever shall receive them into an house of tenement or monastery and suffer them to hold such unlawful assemblies and conventicles, if he be, uh, if he be of low and mean condition, be publicly bastinated as a punishment to himself and as a warning to others. But if they are persons of repute, let them forfeit ten pounds of gold to our treasury. Father, let no Apollinarist or Eutician ever hope for any military preferment, except to be listed in the foot soldiers or garrisons. But if any of them shall be found in any other military service, let them be immediately broke, and forbid all access to the palace, and not suffer to dwell in any other city, town or country, but that wherein they were born. But if any of them are born in this august city, means Constantinople, let them be banished from, from this most sacred society and from every metropolitan city of our provinces. Father, let no Apollinarist or Eutician have the power of calling assemblies, public or private, or gathering together any companies, or disputing in any heretical manner, or of defending their perverse and wicked opinions, nor let it be lawful for anyone to speak or write, or publish anything of their own, or the writings of any others contrary to the decrees of the Venerable Synod of Chalcedon. Let no one have any such books, nor dare to keep any of the impious performances of such writers. And if any are found guilty of these crimes, let them be condemned to perpetual banishment. And as for those who through it the, the desire of learning shall hear others disputing of this wretched heresy, tis our pleasure that they forfeit ten pounds of gold to our treasury. And let the teacher of these unlawful tenets be punished with death. Let all such books and papers as contain any of the damnable opinions of Eutychius or Apollinarius be burned, that all the remains of their impious perverseness may perish with the flames. For it is but just that there should be a proportionable punishment to deter men from these most outrageous impieties. And let all the governors of our provinces and the deputies and the magistrates of our cities now know that if, through neglect or presumption, they shall suffer any part of this most religious edict to be violated, they shall be condemned to a fine of ten pounds of gold to be paid into our treasury and shall incur 
the further or the farther penalty of being declared infamous. Given at Constantinople in the Ides of August and the Consulate of Constantinos and Rufus. End of the long quote. At the same time that they published these cruel laws, the authors of them would fain uh, yeah the authors, uh, authors of them would fain be taught to offer no violence to conscience. This same emperor Martian, in another epistle to the Archimandrites of Jerusalem, at the end of the Acts of the Synods of Chalcedon, says, Such, therefore, is our clemency, that we use no force with anyone to compel him to subscribe or agree with us, if he be unwilling. For we would not, by terrors and violence, drive men even into the path of truth. Who would not wonder that they should thus seek to color over their cruelties? A doctrine is forbidden to be learned or taught under the fer severest penalties which those, thought, which, which those ought to think themselves obliged to profess, who are persuaded of the truth of it, and those who do profess it are for the reason exposed to many punishments. And yet the authors of such punishments would still be thought, uh, thought to offer no violence to conscience. But I would fain now, for what end are all these penalties against heretics ordained? For no other surely, but that men may be deterred by the fear of them from meeting together and openly professing themselves or teaching others those doctrines which they think themselves obliged and conscience both to profess and propagate and that being at length quite tired out by these devils, they may, they may enjoin themselves to the established churches, and at least profess to believe their received opinions. But this is to offer violence to conscience, or to force men by the fear of punishments, not to profess what they believe, or to pretend to believe what they, not, what they do not, neither of which can be done, but in opposition to the voice and dictates of conscience. The constitution of Theodosius was in much severer terms, which is extant in the Code of Theodosius, titled De Judaeis, Libri 116, titled 6, and so on, in which we read thus, quote, Father, we ordain that whosoever shall persuade or force a slave or a free man or forsake the worship of the Christian religion and join himself to any accursed sect or rite, let him be punished with the, lo with the loss of fortune and life. And a little after, let him first incur the forfeiture of his goods, and afterwards be condemned to the loss of life, who by false doctrine shall pervert anyone from the faith. This law so pleases Simonacca, uh, Simenka, sorry, Simenka, that he congratulates that he congratulates himself on its being made by an emperor that was a Spaniard, for after having re, uh, recited it, he adds, quote, "A law truly worthy of an emperor that was a Spaniard, quote, as though it was the glory of Spain to exceed all nations in cruelty and its honor." even in former ages, to have been as remarkable for using severer methods of punishments in this world to miserable heretics than others, as they now are, the are for the barbarities practiced by the bloody tribunal of the Inquisition. The emperors Honorius and Theodosius also, in their code Net Sanct Baptistina Iterior, thus command, quote, if anyone shall be discovered to have rebaptized any of the ministers of the Catholic party, let him be put to death, both the person guilty of this execrable impiety, if he be of an age capable of guilt, and the party seduced by him. Unquote. And that there might be no remains of the opinions condemned by the Synod, and to prevent their being transmitted to posterity. It was prohibited by the severest laws either to keep or transcribe any of their books. 
We have seen before the law of Constantine against all who should conceal any of Arius's books, and another edict of Martian against the books of Eutychus. Theodosius published such another law against the books of Nestorius, after he had been condemned by the Council of Ephesus. El Damnato uh, de, Heret uh, de Heretics well, that's the, the kind of uh, uh, name of a book, I guess. Damnato se de heretics. Let not, let not one dare to keep or read or transcribe the impious books of the accursed and execrable Nestorius, written against the venerable Orthodox party and the decrees of the most holy council of prelates at Ephesus. And we ordain that they be diligently sought after and publicly burned. Justinian also forbids the transcribing any heretical books under the penalty of having the hand cut off. For that after Anthemus had been condemned with the fifth synod, he made his law against his books. In Novel 42, Chapter 1, we read, quote, We prohibit all to keep any of his books. And as it is not lawful for anyone to write or have his possession the books of Nestorius, according as the emperors our predecessors have thought it fit in their constitutions to ordain, with respect to the sayings and writings of Porphyry against Christianity, so let nothing said or written by Severus remain in the possession of any Christian, but let them be abhorred as profane by the Catholic Church and burned by those that have them, unless they are willing to suffer the appointed penalty. Let them not therefore be transcribed to the notaries of any sort, as knowing that the punishment of those who shall write any of his, of his books uh, shall be the loss of their hand. Unquote. From these several laws, Konrad Brunus infers that the, school of, the schools of heretics were to be destroyed. Thus, quote, the schools of heretics are to be destroyed by these means. Heretical masters must be removed, these scholars must be prohibited from coming to their schools. The places they used to meet in must, uh, uh, they used to meet in must be appropriated to ecclesiastical purposes. The masters are to be removed by being publicly put to death. The punishment ordained against heretics who shall dare to teach unlawful opinions, as Valentinian and Martian have decreed. Now here comes again our friend with a strange name, Quikunki, um, in uh, D. Herod. The scholars are to be prohibited from going to heretical schools by a pecuniary marked meaning, so that's a finer, okay, under the forfeiture of ten pounds of gold, according to the constitution of the Emperor Martian uh, in Canquinque and Eos Vero de Herod, he writes. Now this is the end of the quote, I think, where he have already come to. And in general, the houses where heretical assemblies and conventicles are held, are to be forfeited to the king or church. But those, especially wherein their errors and heresies are taught, according to the constitution of Justinian against An uh, Anthemus, etc., interdicimus, autumn, uh, thus did the Christian intimate then the... Ah, oh, what a sentence here. According to the constitution of Justinian against Anthemus, etc., interdicimus, autumn. Thus did the Christians imitate the heathen cruelty. Huh? The Christians, well, <laughs> the Catholics, this should read, for better understanding. Thus did the Catholics imitate the heathen cruelty by persecuting those that differed from them and followed the example of Julian in destroying their schools, which the heathens themselves condemned as, ba as barbarous and cruel. For thus... Amianus Marcellinus declares his laws absolutely commanding some things to be done and forbidding others were generally good, some few excepted, among which was that cruel one, 
by which he prohibited the Christian masters or rhetoric and grammar to teach, to prevent any from forsaking the worship of the gods. But in process of time, under the government of the popes, the edicts of the Christians vastly exceeded this cruelty of Julian. Tis true, these were laws made by the civil magistrate, but that they were published with the appropriation of the bishops, no one can doubt who compares our time with the ancient. The bishops could not bear that their decrees and anathemas should be flighted as, insig uh, in, as insignificant and harmless flashes. They would fain have all condemned by their sentence appear to others to be justly condemned and eagerly thirsted after the mitres and churches of those whose doctrines they were pleased to anathematize. And therefore, in order to get possession of them, it was found necessary to arm the secular power, and to enact civil laws against them, that hereby they might strip them of their dignities and drive them into banishment in order to enter on their vacant seas. Now what I've just read to you, if we understand this correctly, is the combination of state and church and the church ordaining the state to do the post persecution for him. And that's exactly the same thing we have today. Because when we are persecuted in these days, or will be persecuted in the future, you can be sure of the order comes from the church, but the state is the one who does the persecution. Through the police, through the military, and all other means necessary. And what we've just read here is the beginning of the combination of state and church. Now the author continues, Nor let anyone imagine that the ancient times were more holy than ours. The, f the same worldly spirit that now influences our synods governed the councils of the ancient bishops. Even the Council of Nice, so much celebrated and extolled, is an abundant proof of this. Such was the fierce and restless spirit of the bishops they met together, so many and bitter their contentions that, forgetting the principal cause of their meeting altogether, they meanly presented accusations against each other to the emperor, who, that he might put an end to their quarrels, ordered the accusations to be burned, and commanded them that they should immediately go upon the business for which they have been assembled. Who can believe that an assembly of men, inflamed with passion and mutual hatred, and breathing nothing but revenge, would rest contented with having procured the condemnation only of their hated enemies, and not rather use their utmost endeavors to excite the emperor to banish those whom they had condemned? Endeavor, uh, <coughs> but not to rely on conjectures, Socrates, the historian, expressly tells us quote, that Theodosius, bishop of Sinada, is the greater Phrygia, cruelly persecuted the heretics of, Macedonian, uh, of the Macedonian sect, of which there was a great number in that city, driving them not only from the city, but from the very country also not according to the custom of the Orthodox Church, which uses no methods of persecution, for through zeal of the true face, but from covetous desire of enriching himself with the spoils of the heretics. The spoils of the heretics. Yeah, we spoke about that before. Confiscating their goods, fines, and after they took everything away from them, then just kill them. And this is exactly what this is about. To this end, he left no means untried to ruin the followers of Macedonius, arming his clergy and persecuting them by innumerable subtle methods and tricks of law. But as malice was principally levelled against the bishop Agapetus, whom he tried out with repeated injuries. And because he did not think the governors of the provinces sufficient for the punishment of heretics, he went to Constantinople to solicit uh, new edicts from the magistrates. Nor were the bishops of Rome afraid to implore the assistance of the emperor against heretics, 
Pope Anastasius persuaded the judges to condemn the Manichaeans to perpetual banishment, whom he could not bring over to the Catholic faith. Left by their contagion, they should infect the holy flock. And Leo the Great, writing to Leo the Emperor, says, quote, that the perverse and ensnaring disputations of the heretics would soon come to an end, if put under restraint by the imperial power. Unquote. And in his 43rd epistle to the same prince, we read, quote, Vouchable, as our regard for the faith to yield this remedy to the Church, that heretics may not only be kept out of all ho uh, holy orders, but even expelled from every city, that the holy people of God may be in no farther danger of infection from these wicked men. Unquote. In his 45th epistle, he exhorts the Empress Pulcheria that she would banish Eutychius further from Constantinople, that he might receive no comfort from those whom he had drawn over to his impiety. But further, when they had got... <coughs> When they had got into possession of the supreme power in Rome, they were oftentimes the authors of persecution themselves. Pope Celestine, as Socrates the historian relates in his Ecclesiastical History, uh, page 7 probably on chapter 11 or something, I don't put this here, but that is about the Ecclesiastical History, the book that the, his, the historian Socrates wrote, quote, took from the Novicians their churches in Rome, so that Rusticula, their bishop, was forced to meet his flock in private houses. For till this time the Novicians flourished in Rome, were in possession of many churches and had large congregations to fill them. But they, f they fell a sacrifice to envy, because the bishops both of Rome and Alexandria had usurped a tyrannical power, exceeding all the bounds of the priesthood. For this reason, the bishops of Rome did not permit even those who agreed with themselves in opinion to hold free and open assemblies, but though they praised them for their agreement with them in the face, yet deprived them of all their substance. But the bishops of Constantinople were however free from this wicked spirit, for they not only suffered the Novatians to meet within the city, but even bore them a very sincere affection. Unquote. But the bishops of Rome, even when they had no power at Constantinople, yet by their perpetual solicitations of the emperors there, at last extorted from them the oppression of heretics. Whilst Justinian was emperor, the followers of, Ant uh, of Anthemus and Severus held their public assemblies, although they had been condemned and excommunicated by the Pope of Rome. Wherefore the bishops of the second Syria and the Archimedrites and monks sent letters to Agapetus, bishop of Rome, that then at Constantinople, in which they besought them, him to deliver them from heretics. The bishops thus, quote, Take from us speedily these evil men, and offer up this acceptable sacrifice to God and our Saviour, that we may have a good account to give in the future awful judgment. Preserve the ecclesiastical dignity free from all fear, and the thrice-repeated heretical disturbance. Establish our order and put our most just emperor in mind of those many and righteous sentences that were first pronounced from the apostolic chair, ordaining that those who had their impious writings who had their impious writings should deliver them up and commit them to the flames, in imitation of those who were inflamed with zeal to destroy the writings of Manichaeans, and those of the impious Nestorius and the hardened Eutychius and Dioscorus, their father and protector. So will you deprive of all hope those who vainly trust in them. 
We therefore pray, most holy Father, that you would put in execution that sentence against Anthemus, which is both God's and yours, that so all offense may be removed from these little ones, that believe in the Lord and from us all. Unquote. Now the monks also making the same request, in the conclusion give this reason for it, quote, For this cause we have sent you to Rome, and have promised and even undertaken for your desired return. We have received these promises from the most pious emperor, that what you shall canonically pronounce we, he will piously execute, that all the world may be delivered from this present disturbance by them. Unquote. Agapetus had passed his sentence before his request of the bishops and monks, and condemned Anthemus and, Thin Anthemus, and pronounced that as he had been expelled from the bishopric of Constantinople before, so he should now be banished from that of Trapezuntium, and degraded from every priestly office and function. But no sooner had he received these letters of the bishop and monks, but he sent to Justinian the emperor, that he would banish those whom he had condemned for heretics. Baronius adds, when he had done those thing, uh, these things, and thus performed all the duties of his office, the most holy Agapetus died in order to receive his reward, now his work was done. As though it was such an heroic action to conclude his life with exciting the emperor to persecute those whom he had condemned for heretics, as merited the reward of eternal salvation. After the death of Agapetus, the monks renewed their bloody petitions to the emperor and beseeched him that he would banish those whom Anacletus and con had condemned as heretics. Quote, for they say, there is reason to fear, most pious emperor, left for our long delay, that of the people of Israel should happen to us, who have amongst us men accursed from the, peace, from the priesthood, who, because they had in the midst of them Achan and Jonathan, who exposed themselves to a curse, the one willfully, the other through ignorance, were in danger of being entirely destroyed. Though they knew not that they had the accursed thing amongst them. Despise not therefore, O ye most Christian emperors, so great an evil, but be filled with zeal to promote the knowledge of God and his interest fulfilling what is written. A, wife, a wise king scatters the wicked. That with David and Josias, and Elias and Agapetus, who were inspired with the noblest zeal for God, you may have a part in this world, as they had, and bring all your enemies under your footstool, and that he may grant you hereafter with them an eternal kingdom, who hath promised that they will give an hundredfold there, here, and hereafter life eternal." end of this long quote, which actually makes the Pope God on earth. Not long after, Anthemus and his followers were condemned by the Council of Constantinople through the intrigues of the Roman legates, and many petitions were offered to the Emperor for the banishment of those the Synod had condemned as heretics, so that by the cursed solicitations of the ecclesiastics, he was even forced to consent to their persecution. It must, however, be owned that some of the bishops were enemies to persecution, and being of more moderate sentiments, blamed those who defended and encouraged it. So Piteus Severus tells us, quote, that Idacius and Aetheticus foolishly applied themselves to the secular powers that by their sentence and authority they would banish the heretics from cities, meaning Instantius and Salvanius, Helpididius and Priscillinius. And when afterwards Priscillinius appealed from the synod of Bordeaux to the emperor, the bishops Edesius and Atheticus 
followed him as his accusers. But Martin, then Bishop of Treve, which is in Germany, uh, Trier, Treve, but Martin, then Bishop of Treve, was continually soliciting uh, Etaticus to uh, desist from his ac uh, accusation and prayed Maximus that he would abstain from the, block, uh, from the blood of those unhappy men, that it was more than sufficient that they were adjudged heretics and expelled the churches by the uh, episcopal, episcopal sentence, and that it was a new and unheard of impiety that the civil power should judge in the affairs of the church. Here you got it! That the civil power, highlight this here, uh, that it is uh, that it was new and unheard of impiety that the civil power should judge in the affairs of the church. Another sign that there was going on the melting between the church and the state, and the intercession of Martin prevailed so far that whilst he continued at Treve, all process was stopped, and when he was about to go from hence, from thence, by a peculiar influence, he obtained a promise from Maximus that nothing cruel should be inflicted upon the accused, although, after his departure, Priscillianus, Priscillianus was condemned to death. The reason assigned by Bellarmine that these bishops were censured, meaning because they brought an ecclesiastical affair before the emperor and became accusers in a cause of blood, is very frivolous. It is true that Martin blames Atheticus that had accused Priscillianus a Priscillian before the Emperor's tribunal, and that as Sulpicius Severus rectifies, not for not so much from his hatred of heresy as from a desire of revenge. And therefore Martin adds that it was a new and unheard of impiety that the uh, secular power should judge an ecclesiastical cause again secular power should judge an ecclesiastical cause. Now if we go back to the Bible, isn't that exactly what happened at the trial of Jesus before Pontius Pilate? As far as I remember, the Jews, the scribes and the Pharisees who represented the ecclesiastical power of the Jews at that time, brought Jesus before a Roman tribunal. By that forcing the state, the temporal power, yeah, to judge ecclesiastical cause. Exactly the same thing. So here you have it where the roots are, where this goes all back to, already, to the case of Jesus Christ. When he was tried before the Romans for ecclesiastical cause, And there, of course, probably the Roman Catholic Church, quote-unquote, got the idea <laughs> to combine church and state. There's the earliest combination of church and state, when the ecclesiastical powers of Judea relied on the power of the prefect of Rome in Judea to persecute Jesus Christ for ecclesiastical causes. The combination of church and state. And the church is above the state. The church uses the state to get her power through. Okay? That's what was then, and that's what we still have today. So, but by this, Martin plainly shows that secular punishments ought never to be inflicted on religious accounts because matters of faith do not come under cognizance of the secular tribunal, and that the progress, of heres uh, the progress of heresy neither can nor ought to be prevented by the blood of heretics. And therefore, therefore he obtained a promise from Maximus that nothing cruel should be inflicted 
on the accused. We acknowledge with Bellarmine that a bishop ought not to be an accuser in the cause of blood, but at the same time cannot imagine with what justice a bishop who ought not to be and who ought not to act the part of an accuser, may not only excommunicate heretics, but, as Bellarmine contends, deliver them over to the secular power and even exhort the judges to perform their duty. For this is something more than to act the part of an accuser. An accuser only labors to prove the crime that when proved the judge may pass sentence on it. But when a bishop by his own sentence pronounces any person a heretic and delivers him over to the secular arm, he lays the judge under a necessity of burning without any farther examination the miserable heretic. And if through compassion he seems willing to defer the execution, the bishop exhorts and even compels him under the penalty of excommunication to perform his office. Who in such a case will clear the bishop from the guilt of the blood and murder of the heretic? Who doth not see that the bishop is the sole cause and the civil magistrate, who in all things blindly submits to the bishop, is the instrument only of the heretic's death? especially as it is unlawful for him under any pretense to refuse obedient obedience to the bishop's ordiner, orders. If therefore it is unlawful for a bishop to turn, accuser in, uh, to turn accuser in a case of blood, um, much more unlawful is it for him to deliver those he condemns as heretics to the secular arm and press the civil power to put their sentence in execution. But to return from this but to return from this digression, Martin, not content to blame Athaticus, after Priscillian was put to death, excommunicated him and with with him those who were the authors of his murder. The fear of this excommunication saved many that had been thrown into prison from death. The emperor, who favoured Athaticus and Eurcetus, oftentimes pressed that at last, uh, and at last commanded Martin that he should communicate with him, but could not prevail till he had promised to recall the, tribunal, the tribunes that had been sent into Spain to destroy the churches. Nor could he be at last uh, prevailed with notwithstanding the vigorous endeavours of the bishops to subscribe to his consent to communicate with them. So unjust did it seem to him to punish men with death for their errors in matters of faith. Few indeed was the number of these bishops who had the courage to oppose this persecuting spirit, and therefore, generally speaking, the poor heretics were made to undergo all sorts of the most cruel punishments. Again, a very important sentence right here. I'm going to highlight that for you. Nor could he be at last prevailed with, notwithstanding the vigorous endeavors of the bishops, to subscribe to his consent to communicate with them. So unjust did it seem to him to punish men with death for their errors in matters of faith. An interesting sentence to stop this video with before we go into chapter 4, the Aryan persecutions of the Orthodox. That will be, of course, a reading for another time. We have reached almost an hour and I'm going to stop right here. And uh, yeah, it, it was very hard for me not preparing this. Sometimes uh, strange words appear and strange letters <laughs> that I cannot read perfectly. But still, I think we all get to learn a lot from this book, even though my comments are quite restricted. But we see the roots of the church and state working together, and the church telling the state what to do, and the church telling the state to persecute those who are not of their belief system, meaning ecclesiastical causes used as persecution. 
Here we see the real beginnings of it and we are almost 2000 years later, people. The church has only grown more powerful and the state has only grown more powerful. Why? Because the people give the power to the state and the people give the power to the church. That's not the way it is supposed to be. Anyway, it was a quite interesting reading. At least I thought so. I hope you enjoyed it and you learned a little bit. And uh, I'm looking forward to your comments. And until next time, Juggler66 from Hour of the Truth, signing off, says God bless you and bye-bye.